Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm thrilled to have you here. In today's Google Earth Engine tutorial, I'll guide you through the process of calculating changes in water bodies area over time, utilizing Sentinel-2 image collection data. However, it's important to note that this technique is not limited to Sentinel-2. It can be applied with any image collection available in Google Earth Engine. We'll achieve this by calculating the Normalized Difference Water Index, NDWI. Additionally, I'll show you how to generate a chart to visualize the changes over time and how to download the results as a CSV file for further analysis. But before we dive in, if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, please take a moment to do so. Your support means a lot and helps me create more content like this in the future. Now, let's get started. Our first step is to filter the Sentinel-2 image collection for our study area or area of interest, AAOI. Once we've filtered the relevant imagery, we'll proceed to mosaic tiles with the same acquisition date. Mosaicing these tiles is crucial to prevent any duplicate values in our time series. As Sentinel-2, images are stored in Military Grid Reference System, MGRS, tiles. If you're unfamiliar with this concept, I highly recommend watching my previous tutorial where I explain it in detail. Understanding this process will provide valuable context for the steps we're about to take. We'll generate a list of unique dates by mapping a function over the image collection. This will ensure that our time series contains only distinct dates without any duplicates. Now that we have our list of unique dates, our next step is to map a function over it to mosaic images with the same acquisition date. To facilitate further processing, we'll convert the date to milliseconds, which will prove useful when using the helper chart functions later on. We will filter the Sentinel-2 image collection with the new start and end date, the end date will be generated using the advance date method, where we specify a delta of one day. You have the option to adjust this delta to merge images acquired within a larger time range, and then compute a mean or median image. Next, we'll mosaic tiles with the same acquisition date. We'll set both the date and the system time start properties for the mosaic image while we could choose to return either the milliseconds or the formatted date, e.g., YMD, I've opted for the latter for clarity and ease of understanding. However, it's worth noting that the system time start property is considered by default in helper function charts. Now that we've obtained a list of mosaic images, our next step is to convert this list into an image collection. We'll achieve this using the ee.imageCollection.fromImages function, which will take our list of image IDs and convert them into an image collection. Once we have our image collection, we'll proceed to calculate the NDWI for each image. We'll apply a threshold to the NDWI values by mapping a function over the collection. Within this function, we'll first calculate the NDWI and then apply the thresholding. For this tutorial, I've set the threshold for water bodies as NDWI values greater than zero. It's important to note that thresholding generates a binary mask, so we'll convert this to a unitary mask. If you're unfamiliar with thresholding and masking, I recommend watching my tutorials on these topics or my cloud masking tutorial for further understanding. It's worth mentioning here that within the same function, you have the flexibility to apply cloud masking as well. You can choose any band index for your specific application, whether it's for cropland change, forest change, sea level rise, etc. However, for the purpose of this tutorial, we're focusing on calculating the NDWI for water bodies mapping and area change over time. Now that we have our NDWI collection, Let's visualize the first NDWI mask that we generated. Afterward, we'll proceed to calculate the pixel area of water bodies in the mask. 
While we could directly use the helper chart functions at this stage, it's important to note that the on-the-fly API of Google Earth Engine has memory limitations. This means that for larger time durations and high-resolution images, GEE may return a timeout error. To mitigate this issue, it's advisable to export the results first to Google Drive or Earth Engine Assets and later load them. Exporting initiates server-sided rendering, which can handle larger datasets more efficiently. Once the results are exported, they can be easily loaded back into the environment. To achieve this, we'll need to calculate the pixel area of the water mask in the image collection and generate a new feature collection using a function. Within this function, we'll retrieve the image date, calculate the pixel area using the ee.image.pixelArea function, convert the area to square kilometers, and then return a feature with the formatted date, system time start, and area in square kilometers. Next, I'll export this feature collection as a CSV to Google Drive using the export.table.toDrive function. As I've previously explained, this step is crucial because it initiates server-sided rendering, ensuring that the processing is handled efficiently. While my area of interest, AOI, and time duration are small and Earth Engine can process it in less than five minutes, it's important to note that if the processing time exceeds five minutes, Earth Engine may return a timeout or user memory limit exceeded error. Hence, exporting is compulsory for larger datasets or longer processing times. Once exported, I can open the CSV file in Google Drive, download it for further analysis in MS Excel or Google Sheets. Finally, I'll use the helper chart function to generate a chart of date versus area for the time series data. If you're unfamiliar with helper chart functions, I recommend watching my playlist of charts in Google Earth Engine for further understanding. It's worth mentioning that by default, the system time start property is considered for time series charts. That's why it was necessary to create this property. If it wasn't there, Google Earth Engine would give me an error stating that no feature with the property of system time start exists. However, if you explicitly define the date, there will be no errors. If you've learned anything from this tutorial, please like this video and subscribe to my channel for more beginner-friendly Google Earth Engine tutorials. You can find the code link in the video description. Feel free to drop any comments or queries in the comments section or ask me through email. I'll see you in the next one. Peace.